So today we are continuing in our belief series as we work through the book of John. And this week's message is titled, Are You Listening? Now many people think listening and hearing are the same thing, but they are not. For example, right now you all hear me. I'm making a noise with my mouth and your ears are picking up that noise and turning it into sound. And it's a relatively passive act, meaning that you don't really have to think about it in order to hear anything. It just happens whether you want it to or not. For example, at night, if you're trying to sleep, but someone has the TV on in the house a little too loud, you're not trying to hear it, you don't want to hear it, but you hear it anyway. Now, listening, that is something that is active. It's something you have to think about. Because listening is when you take those sounds that you're hearing and you actually think about it somehow. It means you have to give it some thought, which means you actually have a choice to listen or to not listen. How many times have you been in a classroom when a teacher has just been going on and on and on about a subject? And you're doing your best to try to pay attention. But uh, eventually your mind starts to wander What's for lunch? What am I going to do when I get home? What am I going to do this weekend? Um, it's almost like you're Charlie Brown and all you hear is wah, 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 until you hear your name. As soon as you hear your name called, you snap to attention and you're ready to respond and you start listening. Now, sometimes it takes more than just hearing your name. I know for me, I can think of many times back in my younger days, I'd be playing a video game and my mother would say something. And uh, all I would hear is, Darren, wah, 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 wah. Now, I didn't really have time to think about what she was asking. I mean, is she asking that I finish my homework? Did I take out the trash? Why is the stove on fire? I, I don't have time for any of that because I'm about to set the high score. So... But my mom, she knew how to instantly turn that hearing into listening. And it's probably the same thing for a lot of your parents. And that's by using your first and your middle name. <laughs> Darren Allen, no matter what I was doing, you had my, my attention. And I was listening and ready for whatever command came next. So listening is key in this week's scripture that we're going to cover. And it's from John chapter 10, verses 10 through 21. And in most Bibles, this section is actually labeled, I am the good shepherd. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep." And the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I also must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Therefore, there was division amongst the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do we listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. I pray that you go before me for this message and you touch everyone's hearts and prepare them for the words that you have for them. And I pray that this message reaches everyone exactly where they are. We ask these things in your mighty name. Amen. So why are we as humans oftentimes in the Bible referred to as sheep? And Jesus is represented as the good shepherd. Well, the people at that time, they fully understood what shepherding and taking care of sheep and livestock was like. That was their primary, uh, their primary jobs. It was a very agrarian uh, culture. So at any point, so any point that Jesus was actually trying to make, he could use an analogy of shepherding, and everyone would know exactly what he was talking about. People know, at least back then, and I'm going to tell you now, shepherds take care of their sheep. They provide for them, they protect them, and they are a source of comfort for them. Now, that sounds a lot like the characteristics of Jesus, doesn't it? Because Jesus cares for us, he provides for us, he protects us, and he is also a source of comfort. Now, humans and sheep, we have a lot in common. We both are very valuable. So back then, um, as well as now, uh, sheep were a very valuable possession. Um, they were not only a source of food and milk, but also their wool, obviously, but their skins were also used for clothing and as well as coverings for the walls of the structures. Now, humans, we are very valuable to Jesus. He paid for us with his life and what he did on the cross with his own precious blood. Sheep and humans also are very similar because we are both pretty dumb. No matter how good a sheep may have it, they'll be sitting in a green pasture, plenty of food. There's a nice, uh, still, still a body of water where they can drink from, but they'll just get bored. And they'll just start wandering off if you're not constantly watching them, if they're allowed to. And when they wander off, they get lost very easily and cannot find their way back. As you guessed it, humans, we often will wander off out of God's presence and get lost and get caught up in things that are dangerous to us. Another thing that sheep and humans have in common is we are natural followers. Sheep have a very strong instinct to stick together. So when they see one heading off, another one's going to follow it, and then another one. It doesn't matter that they might be marching off to certain doom or to a cliff. They all want to stick together, and they're all going to follow whoever happens to be the leader at that one moment. In humans, of course, we tend to follow the lead of others as well, even into certain danger. So here in the 10th chapter of John is the picture of Jesus assuming the role of the shepherd of the sheep. Now, this story actually occurs right after the events in chapter 9, where the man who was born blind was healed and received his sight. And he was very excited because he could now see the world around him. Now, the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders at the time, they demanded to know how this man could have received his sight because it wasn't adding up to them, because their reasoning is this man could have only received a sight through a miracle, but it was the Sabbath. So 
no one is allowed to work or perform miracles on the Sabbath. So whoever performed this miracle must not be godly. That just doesn't really add up. And so they were grilling him, and uh, they just couldn't wrap their heads around the answers that he was giving and who Jesus actually was. And they ended up actually kicking the man out of the synagogue. Now, folks have been following these so-called religious leaders at the time for so long. But instead of leading the people to God, they were actually leading them astray and into danger. They were shepherding the people, but they were false shepherds, not the true shepherd. And this, of course, rubbed Jesus the wrong way, so he had to address it. So to fully understand everything that's happening in chapter 10, you have to understand what shepherding was like back then. So during the day, a shepherd would take their flock out to an open pasture so they could graze. And then every night, the shepherds would bring their flock into a central location, a a sheepfold or a a pen. And it was big enough so that there were several different flocks could go in there. And so a shepherd would lead their sheep into the sheepfold, um, which was a structure where they couldn't get out, as well as keep other wild animals and things like that out. Um, They wouldn't be able to get in either. And there was only one entrance in and out of the sheepfold, and it was a gate. And it was guarded by a gatekeeper. And this gatekeeper, he had only one job, and that was to make sure only authorized people were allowed to go into the gate and to keep all the sheep in. Now, once all the sheep were safely in the pen, the shepherd could go off and have his dinner and sleep and relax for the night until the next morning where he would come back to get his sheep so he can take them out to pasture again. But of course, overnight, all the sheep, since there were different flocks in there, they've all kind of mixed together. So the shepherd only wants his flock to come out. So the interesting thing about sheep is they will learn their shepherd's voice. They will learn that each shepherd will have a certain call or vocalization in order to call their sheep. It could be a little, I'm not going to try to make any of those weird sounds, but they can do certain sounds that only their sheep recognizes when that particular shepherd does that, and they'll come and line up right behind him and follow him wherever he's going to go, and he takes them out into the pasture for the day. All the other sheep, they're going to ignore it until their shepherd comes and actually calls them. So with that context, let's take a closer look at the scripture. So in this first section, we learn the marks of a true shepherd, who is Jesus. Jesus tells us that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, that same is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So what does he mean by the door? Well, like I said, he's referring to the gate of the sheepfold. That gate is the normal, proper entrance in order to get in. Just like the doors to this church are the normal, proper ways to get in. I don't recall seeing any of you crawling in through the windows or fast roping from a helicopter onto the roof and sliding in through the air vents like you're Mission Impossible or something, trying to sneak in to the seats. No, you came in through the proper way, which is the doors. Now, before Jesus was born, prophets had predicted the way that he was going to enter the world. They foretold the circumstances of his his birth. Micah said that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said he was going to be born of a virgin and that his name would mean wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Jesus was the exact fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. No other person in the history of Israel came to Israel this way. This is how we know Jesus was the true shepherd. He came the predicted way, the accepted way. He entered through the door. And if you don't come through the door, you're considered a thief 
and a robber, meaning that you're just up to no good. Obviously, you're not there for the benefit of the sheep. Now, another mark of the true shepherd is that the gatekeeper, gatekeeper will open the gate for him. Now, remember, the gatekeeper only has one job, and that's to open the gate for those that are allowed. So in this context, you can look at John the Baptist as the gatekeeper. In John chapter 1, verse 23, John the Baptist says, He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was the forerunner that Isaiah had predicted right before Jesus was, the Messiah was to come. He opened the door for the true shepherd. And just like I said that the shepherd has a call that only his sheep respond to, it's like us getting called by our first and our middle name by our parents. Jesus, through our spirit, he has a call for us. And when we respond to that call, he leads us out. Now, the shepherd leads the sheep from the sheepfold in the morning to go out to pasture so they can feed and grow and thrive. Jesus leads us out of darkness into light, away from the false teachers and the false shepherds, so that we will be in a spiritual place of growth. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Notice that the shepherd doesn't drive the sheep. He doesn't corral them and try to force them to go in a particular direction. No, a true shepherd leads his sheep. He goes before them. He's out in front. He's the example. He's not asking the sheep to go anywhere that he hasn't already gone himself. Now, Jesus, he's not detached from what we go through. He's experienced all of it and more, minus sin, of course, since he was sinless. But all the pressures that we experience, all the dangers and the pitfalls of life, he understands what it's like. He understands us and what we go through. And that should provide great comfort. Now, the same instinct that enables a sheep to recognize the voice of the true shepherd, it also prompts them to flee, to get away from a stranger. Now, in this story, the strangers were the Pharisees and the other leaders of the Jewish people who only were interested in the sheep, the people, for their own personal gain, to take advantage of them and not for God's glory. The blind man who received the sight illustrates this. He recognized the voice of Jesus. He was talking to Jesus, knew exactly who he was. But he also knew the Pharisees were strangers and he was trying to get away from them, even to what seemed like his own detriment, which meant getting kicked out of the synagogue. Now, it says that Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Remember, Jesus is actually addressing and speaking to the Pharisees here. And they just weren't following what he was talking about. Have you ever tried explaining something to somebody and without even saying a word, you can just tell by the look in their eyes or the expression on their face that they're just not tracking with you? Yeah, it was a little bit like that. So Jesus kind of switched it up a little and he gave a different illustration. I am the door. So now Jesus is positioning himself as the door. Now, to understand this, you have to understand what happens in the middle of the day for a shepherd back then. So in the middle of the day, so after the, after the shepherd would take his sheep out in the morning and they would graze, in the middle of the day, they would take a rest. So what he would do is actually make a temporary corral, a little temporary pen for them wherever they were. It might be up against a cliff wall or use some rocks and use bushes and things, but it was something to corral the sheep to keep them from wandering off, but would allow the shepherd to rest. The thing is with this temporary enclosure, it didn't have a door. The opening was only wide enough for the sheep. So what the shepherd would do is he would literally lay down across that opening. So anything to get in or out 
had to go over the shepherd. Nothing would get by him. So Jesus then references others that come to the people of Israel claiming some kind of authority or position. This includes the Pharisees and the other so-called religious leaders, folks that were not here for the benefit of the sheep, thieves and robbers, taking something that doesn't belong to them. Jesus then said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So remember, he's across the door. To get in and out, you have to go through Jesus. Salvation can only be received through Christ. We must enter in by Christ, by the power that he gives. And this invitation is for everyone. It's for Jews and Gentiles alike. And to be saved... A person must enter in, enter into relationship with Jesus to receive Christ by faith. And it's a personal act, and without it, there just isn't any salvation. So he then goes on to say that they will go in and out and find pasture. Now, this is the picture of perfect security and freedom in service to the Lord. We enter into the presence of God by faith to worship. And then we go out into the world to witness for the world, witness for the Lord, sorry. So Jesus is not only the Savior and the one who gives freedom. He's also the sustainer and the satisfier. And his sheep find pasture in the word of God. Just like literal sheep find find uh, nourishment, and they grow when they're in an actual pasture. Again, Jesus mentions a thief, saying this time that the thief would even kill the sheep if it would help their selfish gains. Now, this is in sharp contrast to Jesus, who came to us to give, not to get. And what is it that Jesus gives? Life. We receive life the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. After we're saved, we find that there are actually various degrees of enjoyment of life on this side of heaven. The more we walk in the Spirit, the more we enjoy the life which he has actually given us. Now, in this next section, Jesus goes back to referring to himself as a shepherd. A good shepherd is willing to die For the sheep. Think about David. Uh, While he was watching his family's flock, he fought a bear and he fought a lion. This was truly a selfless act. And I got to think about it. In the moment, I'm sure he didn't really think it through fully. If you're sitting there shepherding your sheep and then you see an animal that weighs 300, 500 more pounds than you, sharp claws, sharp teeth, runs a lot faster than you, uh, snatch up, snatches up one of your sheep. While that single sheep may not seem very significant, it was very important to David in, because David cared because he was the shepherd. And he would do whatever it would take to protect the sheep, including putting himself into harm's way. Jesus, as the good shepherd, was willing to die for his sheep, us. Because he loves us and we matter to him. That's why he died for us and rose again. It was a selfless act. And it's the mark of a good shepherd. Now contrast that with a hireling. Someone that, who's just hired to watch the sheep. Not the owner of the sheep. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard someone say, or maybe you've even said it yourself, I'm not getting paid enough for this. That's a hireling. You're only in it for the paycheck. The religious leaders at the time, they were the hirelings. They only regarded the sheep, the people, as something to be exploited and to be used to advance and to build themselves up, not for God's glory. 
And when the enemy comes, whenever the lion or the bear strikes, they will flee, leaving the sheep to fend for themselves, not caring for them. So then Jesus goes on to speak to the intimate, personal relationship that he desires from us. He directly compares the relationship he has with the sheep to the relationship he has with the Heavenly Father. That same union between the Father and the Son also exists between the shepherd and the sheep, between Jesus and us. And now Jesus talks about the other sheep that aren't of this fold that he must bring in. The fold that he speaks of is the nation of Israel. The other sheep is us, Gentiles. So right here, Jesus is actually looking beyond the cross, beyond the resurrection. And he's looking forward to the time that the gospel would actually reach all the nations of the earth. And the result of his selfless act on the cross and his resurrection was what helped the gospel break out beyond the boundaries of Israel and spread throughout the world. If you really think about it, not a single one of us would be here right now as believers in Jesus if he had not been willing to lay down his life for the sheep. But he did. And here we are together as one flock with one shepherd. I lay down my life that I may take it again. I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Jesus laid down his life. He had the power to do it. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Jesus was hounded to death or that he was ever crucified against his will. He chose to die for us. He could have prevented it. It says that even on the night that he was captured, it says he was praying, that he was sweating blood, that he was praying to the Heavenly Father. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Basically saying, Father, if there is any other way that this can happen, let's go with option B. But Jesus was obedient. And he did say, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. He gave himself up. And he took his life again that he might share it with us. That's why he calls us to himself in our spirits, using our first and our middle names. Now, back when I was a kid in the summertime, I had a few rules that I had to follow whenever I was out playing. Um, and I had a lot of freedom within those rules and those parameters. One of those rules is probably the same one many of you had, which is you had to be home before the street lights were on. Um, as long as you're home before the street lights were on, you didn't have a specific time you had to be home. Another rule that I had to follow was we had to play outside. We weren't allowed to go to a friend's house and play inside. We had to stay outside in the yard or back then playing in the street. Um, Another one of those rules is we had to stay within about two blocks of the house. We, we knew specifically we weren't allowed to go past this house. We weren't allowed to go across this street or what have you. So if I wanted to go to the playground or the library, um, we, then we would have to get special permission to do that so our parents knew where, where I was. So as long as, as long as the street lights weren't on, as long as it was close enough to the house and I was playing outside, all day long, I could be at any of my friend's house doing anything, having lots of freedom. Now, staying within the two blocks of the house was very important because back then, at least in my neighborhood, if your parents needed you, all they did is they came out on the front porch and they yelled out your name. And when you heard your name, you better start running home. 
I remember one time I was playing football. We were in the middle of a play in, in a buddy's backyard. And we're in the middle of a play, and then one of my buddies, he starts running off, and he doesn't come back. I'm like, where's Todd going? I don't know. I think his mom called him or something. I'm like, we're thinking, okay. And we continue on playing. We didn't even notice when other parents were calling other kids. We were only listening for our name because that was the only one that really mattered to us. And you never wanted to not hear your name called because if you didn't hear your name called, you were either too far away, you were inside, or you were just plain ignoring your parents. Either way, it was a reason to get grounded. So you definitely were always listening for when your name was getting called. So let me ask you something. Who's calling you now? Whose voice are you currently following? Which flock do you belong to? Is it a politician or a political party? Is it the latest ideology or theory that's permeating our culture? Or maybe it's the latest expert that made a YouTube video that's making all the rounds. Which shepherd are you following? Where are you finding your provision, your protection, and your comfort? Is it someone like the hireling, only wanting to use and exploit you, not really interested in your well-being? Because there are a lot of proud and pretentious people out there that are very loud and have a platform that can appeal to our secular side, our flesh. But these people are false shepherds. And, but because they say what we want to hear or saying something that we already agree with, we tend to start following them. We follow them just like the sheep blindly fo follow the one that's in front of them, even if it's straight to the slaughterhouse. If you're not following the true shepherd, Jesus Christ, then you are being led into certain danger. We have to learn the true shepherd's voice so that we are not led astray to our demise. Now, don't get me wrong. It isn't always a one or the other kind of choice. If you are following Jesus, his anointing could be on a politician. Or his anointing could be on a new ideology or new theory. Or his anointing could even be on that YouTube expert in that video. The thing is, using our own understanding, our flesh, we just don't know that. You have to be following Jesus first and foremost so that you'll be blessed with the wisdom and discernment in all things. So following Jesus may not be the popular opinion with those who don't know his voice. Even back during this episode when this was happening, Jesus was causing division amongst the people. They asked, why do you listen to him? Now, Jesus was speaking words of love and words of wisdom. But people were rejecting him in what he was saying. They were saying he was mad or that he had a demon, not worthy to be listened to. This, unfortunately, still goes on today. Sure, you ask anyone about Jesus, they'll say, oh, oh, he's a great man, a great teacher. Yeah, love him. But if you really break down really what Jesus taught, then people are going to be divided. Because the Jesus in our culture today, people have turned him into this caricature of, and, and they've made him, they've, they've forced him into this mold to fit into whatever narrative that they want to justify their own selfish desires. It's not the true Christ. And his teachings have been so twisted by our culture that what is good is called evil, and what is evil is now being called good. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. I'll, I'll, I'm reading something or I'm watching something, and I'm like, really? 
Is this what's actually happening? This is acceptable. This is something to aspire to. And it's happening so fast. It's turning. And the things that are from the true Christ is something that's considered hateful. And it has to be squashed and purged. This is the result of a people, of a flock, led astray from following a false shepherd. So how do you learn the good shepherd's voice so you'll know who to follow? First, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10 tells us that when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And when that happens, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's like a direct link to hear Jesus in our spirits. This gives us the ability to hear his voice, to listen to his voice. And how do we learn to do that, to listen better to his voice? Well, it's like any other relationship. You spend time with them. That's how you get to know someone. Hang out with them for a while. How do you do that with Jesus? Pretty simple. Through prayer, through worship, and spending time in the Word. It's never too late to start that relationship with Jesus. Even if you've known Jesus for decades, you can get to know him better. And when you know how to listen to his voice, you'll know what to do and where to go. Just as the good shepherd leads the sheep, he will lead you to a more abundant life in the here and now and to an everlasting and into everlasting salvation in the internal. Jesus is calling you. Do you hear him? But most importantly, are you listening? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our good shepherd. Lord, we thank you that you care about each and every one of us. We thank you that you have gone before us. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I pray for those of us who are struggling with hearing the true, your true voice. Lord, I just pray that whatever is keeping us from choosing you, because we all can hear you, we're not all listening. Lord, I just pray whatever that roadblock is, you point that out to us. Whatever that stronghold is that you want us to give up and give to you and lay at your feet. For each and every one of us, Lord, I pray you reveal that to us so we can lay that down. And Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for caring about this and that this is very important to you. Lord, I thank you for your comfort and I thank you for your provision for us, your flock. We ask these things in your mighty name. Amen.